if I'm not reaching my potential every single day, I'm not being fiduciary responsible to myself, my inner self, my external self, my family. Like every day I've got to reach the potential of that day. Otherwise, why am I even here? Hey babes, it's Kayla Craft with the Mommy Millionaire Podcast. I'm a mom of three littles, ER nurse turned self-made millionaire and lifestyle entrepreneur. I am bringing you inspiring stories, business and mindset tips to help you be shameless in pursuing your ambitions. Hey, Mommy Millionaires. I am so excited about today's special guest. I'm going to introduce you to him in just a second, but I want to remind you guys that Mommy Millionaire Live is just around the corner. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, head over to mommymillionaire.co because this is the number one event for female entrepreneurs that you're going to want to be at in Scottsdale this year. So I can't wait to see you there. Now, today on the podcast, we have Ben Anderson. He has been a top 20 US loan originator from 2011 to 2018. He's closed more than $3 billion in home loans and he mentors loan originators all over the world. He has a best selling book called Home Owner Now and he also owns Red media. I am so excited to chat with Ben today. And also a lot of you guys sent in a ton of questions. So we're going to ask him all of those today. So stay tuned. Welcome Ben to the show. And I'm so happy to be here. Since we talked months ago, I just felt like it was a matter of time before I could uh, sit here with you and, and just have, have a better time. I mean, how could it get better than this? I'm, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Well, the last time I saw you, you were on um, our Upgrade Your Life show. Uh, mm-hmm. So for those of you guys listening in, if you haven't watched that, head over to UpgradeYourLife.tv and check out that episode because it was really fun. I loved getting to know you because you know, looking at like all of your success now, you know, it looks like, gosh, you know, has it been easy? Cause it looks, you make it look easy, but I know it wasn't always easy for you. And I love that story. You talk about the donut shop that your mom used to drop you off at growing up. Can you share with everybody a little bit about your childhood? Yeah. I would never have my kids do the same thing. Uh, I don't care what the outcome would be, but I grew up in a single family home, single parent home where my dad literally lived 15 minutes away from us. And I didn't see him ever. Wow. That was my reality, but I didn't, it was normal. I, I was protected from just what he was about, which he's just a cancerous person. So my mother, in order to get us a better life, I lived and grew up in the ghetto. And in order to get us to go to school, I got a scholarship, like a partial biracial scholarship to go to a school in the nicer suburbs of town, which is like 45 minutes away. Because it was so far away, we had to get picked up super early because there were several bus stops along the way. So we had picked up at about 6.15 every single morning. My mom worked three jobs in order to put us through school and life. And with those three jobs, required us to get dropped off about 5 to 5.15 in the morning. So two little kids, and we lived in the Bay Area um, outside San Francisco. And so it's very cold, especially in the winters. And so we would literally be huddling, my brother and I, underneath this awning when it was raining to stay warm. And after a few months, the donut shop owner invited us to come in. So we looked at getting up early like a good thing because we got to get sweet treats for free and (laughs) and holes and eat whatever we wanted and have hot chocolate. So our early upbringing, I learned and I saw what hard work was was required because we needed to work hard. My mom had to work hard just to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. And she dropped two little kids off at 5 to 5.15 every morning in the ghetto by a random coffee shop and just kind of said, you're going to be okay. <laughs> well, and you just believed her clearly because you turned out okay. And some parts of me, yes, but mostly, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It's crazy to think about like, like, yeah, you would never, I, I don't think I could ever do that with my kids, but she did the best with what she could at that time. Right. So power and hats off to your mom. That's amazing. Thank she you. has to be super proud of you today. I'm sure she did. She, did, she did what she had to do. Mm-hmm. And so for, for me and my brother, our wives laugh all the time because they say we don't have empathy. I think we have empathy. We just have a higher tolerance for pain. So when my kids are having a bad day. I'm like, what are you complaining about? You have to wait by a bus stop. So <laughs> when you grow up in a different life and you grow up 
with <clears throat> like survival being your reality, your tolerance for things just becomes a little bit thicker. So mm-hmm. I think that's driven me to do some of the things that I'm working on. And my brother, you know, graduated Stanford, MBA, uh, bought and sold a couple of companies. So when you go through tough stuff, you just come out with tougher. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that brings me to a question, a random question. Does that make you worried about your kids at all? Because I think about that all the time. I think the reason I'm so tough is because of the way that I grew up and my kids, they have it so easy. You know, I don't give them everything, but I mean, they, they have a good life. And does that make you worried that they're not going to have that drive that you have? It does all the time. And so it, it, I get them up with me and I make them do things that I do. Okay. When I work on the weekends, I make them get up at six o'clock in the morning with me and even sit there while I'm working out. So I make them see the things that I had to do. And I try to explain to them that, yes, your kid's parents might be a certain way, but that's not how we are. Yes, they get tons of privileges. Yes, they get all the sneakers that they want. Yes, they get every sports team. Yes, they get to go to the private school. Yes, they get to be in nice cars. Yes, 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 yes. But I teach them and embed them that it's hustle. And they know that if I, they don't see me, I make sacrifices. Mm-hmm. So I make them make sacrifices too. And they have to sacrifice not seeing me a lot during the week. And mm-hmm. when I come home, they know dad's paying the mortgage. And I just have the conversation with them. I'm not going to be able to change the pattern of their life, but I could change their mentality to just to being hardworking kids. You know what? I love that. And speaking of the like donut shop and just the way that you grew up, does that make you want to give back at all? Like, how do you give back? Because those people in the donut shop, they didn't have to do that. That was so nice of them. That was so nice of them. I, I, my parents run the Bay Area Rescue Mission. It's the largest nonprofit homeless shelter in the Bay Area Aww. for underprivileged. So I grew up with a total relationship to people that had nothing. And being 10, 12, being around drug addicts and drug abusers and people on the street. So I bring my kids back to Richmond, California to go serve Thanksgiving to give, they will physically give a plate of food to a kid that doesn't have any food. And I I show them that you're literally only one bad week or one bad month or one bad choice of being that kid. So am I. So I give back to my community where I'm from. I mentor young men and women from Bay Area. My parents run a nonprofit. I'm always there every holiday that I can get. I bring my team with me to come serve. My, my in-laws come with me to come serve. So anytime that I can get back there, that's where I serve. So it gives me, it's my home. So it's not, I don't look at giving back because that's just, my roots are already so embedded there. I just bring people who want that experience. You know, you're welcome to come. Anytime you want to go to the Bay Area for Thanksgiving and see true people's lives changed, just come along. And that's how I get back by giving other people in Orange County or California or my friends or investors I work with, I invite them with me. And that's how I get back. I love that. Okay. I'm going to have to come one time. Yep. So you're now huge in the mortgage industry. You wrote this best-selling book called Homeowner Now. Talk about the book. So the book's my story and why I created Homeowner Now. And I've always been someone that has fought for injustice on a macro scale, when you're a kid and you see violence and crime, super, super young, you have a great barometer on injustice. So I can be in my office and I can see who's not being treated right. And so I created a book about my story. And one excerpt from the story that I'll share is when I was a kid and my parents were splitting, I watched my mom getting abused by my dad. And so I stood there in the middle of them too. And I said, you've got to go through me to get to her. And I'm five years old. Oh my you know, gosh. those are things I went through as a kid. So when I got through life and I played baseball and got into real estate, I started really seeing a lot of the same injustices of the consumer being fully taken advantage of by scrupulous loan officers, by shady real estate agents, and by these people that weren't doing best for the consumer. So I created a company called Homeowner Now, which allows someone that wants to buy a home or sell a home or get money out of their home to be able to find someone who is a good expert to help them. Because right now, the average everyday consumer that wants to buy a home goes online, enters their information to a website, hits submit, 
and then gets robocalled by someone that doesn't even know who they are. Mm. So I'm trying to create relationships within real estate and saying, look, if you want to buy a home, if you want to finance a mortgage, if you want to sell your home, come to homeownernow.com where you can actually choose an expert who you believe is not going to take advantage of you. And we can keep relationships alive in real estate with all these tech companies looking to wipe out the salesperson. We're looking to advocate for the salesperson, just like I advocated for people back in my old school days that didn't have choice to make the right life moves for themselves. I love that. Okay. So everybody, we'll, we will make sure to link up Homeowner Now to this podcast show so you guys can pick up that book and also go to his website. Now, I had a ton of people write in questions for you, okay? And these are people that are just, you know, maybe investors. And then there's a couple mortgage professionals that want some advice from you. So uh, somebody wants to know, being a mortgage professional, what is your number one advice for building their business? It is so easy. It is cut out everything in the middle about the consumer and go right to the consumer and help them by giving them advice. People want to buy leads or want to go chase relationships. And most loan officers build their business based on chasing real estate agents for business. But if that real estate agent has a dry season or don't produce or they retire or leave the industry, your entire career is starting all over again when your partners leave the industry. If you want to be a successful loan officer, go to the person that makes the decision and work with decision makers. And then by you helping the person that wants to buy a home or sell a home, you have business to feed back to your partners. So focus on getting customers to work with you. So one easy way to do that is just go on, let's say, go on Instagram today and record a video about what you do and how you do it or the market, whatever comes to mind. Put it on Instagram, put it on your story for even, and maybe you'll get you know 35 views, maybe 100 views. Put it on your feed. Maybe you'll get uh, 50 likes if it's good content. Every single like is a lead. So right there are consumers. If you say, look, if you're looking to buy a home or looking to sell a home, now's the best time to buy because rates just dropped and rates are at five-year lows. So the price, the payment on a $500,000 house today is 350 bucks cheaper than it was last month. Wow. Below. And just put that content out there. And everyone that likes your content matches them back. And that's a free lead from a consumer direct that you can get engagement from in seconds. And that took you less than five minutes to do. And it's free. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Such good advice. So is right now the great time to buy a home? Now is the best time it's ever been to buy a home because people say, well, there's going to be a bubble. There's going to be this burst. Mm -hmm. I look at it this way. It's about the cost to stay in a home. So if you're buying a home for a million dollars, and that payment was $5,000 a month two months ago, and it's $4,000 a month now, that's what should be driving your home ownership, not the value of the property, which you can't control. You can't time what the market's going to do. You need a place to live in. The home is worth a million today. Maybe it goes down to nine fifty dollars tomorrow. But you're living in a long-term asset. Eventually, it's going to be worth more, worth more than you paid for it. So don't make your choice based on the price of the home because you can't time it right. What you can time is when rates are low and payments are affordable and go buy a home now because rates are as low as they've been in like five years. Okay. So this is going to be a controversial topic for you, but what do you say to like, you know, big guys out there like Grant Cardone who are saying, don't buy your house, rent and invest in multifamily properties. What do you say to that? I think that I'm the expert on that topic because I have close $3 billion in mortgage. Mm -hmm. I've talked to probably 100,000 people that are actually buying homes. So I'm the expert on that topic. And the answer is, it's different for everybody. For Grant Cardone, he's not going to go buy his primary home that's a million dollars. That's not his style of life. Mm -hmm. So for him, it makes way more sense to go rent a $25 million mansion than to go buy a $25 million mansion. Because that $25 million mansion is going to make him put down $5 million cash. Right. Why well, he put down $5 million cash and then have a $100,000 payment when he can have the same house for $20,000 a month with no cash down? That's him. For everybody else, you have to have a place to live in. 
So if you're going to be renting a home for $4,000 a month and you can afford to buy it for $4,000 a month, why wouldn't you buy over rent if the down payment is minimal? And over time, your house gets paid down. You can use the money again to reinvest it. Now, the best strategy is partially what he says. And partially the strategy is to, if you're going for long term, buy investment properties because you can stick tenants in those homes. Those tenants can pay your house off Mm -hmm. and you can have that capital down the road. And rents always go up in time. So the answer is this. If you want to be fancy, go rent. If you want to be practical, go buy. If you want to go live the dream, go rent the dream. But if you want to have an investment future, go buy the investment properties. Mm. And I know someone like Gary B was kind of criticized because he said, I would never buy a home again. My team sat down with Gary B and explained to him. And he was really kind of like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. That if you're buying a property, because he his thought was, why go type all your capital into a house and you can't have that capital to invest it? He didn't even know that you can put down three and five percent in a home. And that's the differentiator is yes, I don't believe in putting down 20%, putting all your cash into a home, and then the home goes down in value and you're kind of cash poor. Invest 20 or 30 or 40% of your cash into a home and then save the rest. So put less cash down on your home would be the answer. Okay. I love that. So another person said, what should a person look for when deciding on which loan to get? Someone should look for the cheapest possible payment that also pays the principal down. 30-year fixed loans are not practical. No one keeps anything for 30 years. It doesn't matter. You're going to keep a mortgage. The average person does 10 mortgages in their life. And so to think you're going to get a 30-year mortgage, that's not really practical. I think a five or a seven or a 10 year fixed loan that saves you 500 or a thousand bucks a month is really more practical. And you can always refinance your mortgage as rates go down. So I think you want to get a loan that's fixed for at least a set amount of time, five to 10 years. And as the market gets better, you can refi to a lower interest rate. But a 30 year fixed mortgage is not very practical for most people because they don't stay in homes that long. Okay. I love that advice. Now, do you have a strategy for helping people pay off their loans quicker? Absolutely. So there's a couple of pay off loan quicker strategies. One of which is you can set up with any lender. It's not anything fancy. It's a buy, uh, bi-monthly payment schedule. So if you take your, let's say that there's, there's your payments, $3,000 a month. Most people pay 3000 on the first. Well, if you pay 1500 every two weeks, as opposed to 3000 on the first, you're tricking yourself to pay, make more payments because you're actually paying an extra payment or payment and a half a year. Because in, in one month, there could be 30 or 31 days. So some months you end up making three payments because you pay every two weeks half your payment. So by doing that, you pay off your loan eight years faster. It's wow. a really strategy. So you can save on a million dollar mortgage, three or 400,000 in cash by making half your payment every two weeks versus the whole payment once a month. Wow. I love that. Oh my gosh. There's so many good nuggets here. How did you, so how did you become an expert in all this? Was it just from experience? It was from experience and having a big old fat chip on my shoulder. And my very first mortgage job that I got, I was an ex athlete and a personal trainer. And then the guy tells me, that I was never fit for a desk job and I shouldn't be a mortgage guy and I should just be a fitness guy. And that's right then where I decided to be the best LO in the market. And so I've just dedicated myself to listening to what my customers have to say and learning through the questions that they have. Mm -hmm. Because if I can learn to answer all their questions, what else is there besides that? I know how to address their needs. I don't go read out of a textbook, Mortgage 101, I talk to people and ask them, what do you need? And by their answers, I learn because I'm very perceptive on human behavior because I grew up in the hood. Mm -hmm. And so I had to watch for things that were danger signals. I didn't read out a textbook. Plus, I'm not the best textbook reader in the world. I'm better at visually watching things as they go down. So because of that, I listen to people. I listen to what they say. And I learn how to change my business based on what the customer needs, which is why I'm so consumer centric in my business. So you guys listen to understand and ask good questions. Absolutely. 
What are your thoughts on real estate investments? Should people invest in single family homes or multi unit? Somebody asked this. I think if you're going to buy your very first home, the very best advice I can give you, if you're willing to not be fancy, let's just say, is to buy a three, two, three, or four unit property. It's the best advice you could possibly get mm-hmm. because you can put down 3.5%. So let's kind of walk through that. And let me explain it in a way we'll understand. The government gives you loan limits that go up based on the number of units that you buy. So let's say, for example, a two unit property might have a government, let's say a one unit property might have a government loan limit of 730,000. Well, if it's two, it's 850. If it's three units, it's 980. If it's four, it's like 1.2. So you could literally buy a $1.2 million four unit property and put down three and a half percent which is called 50 grand. And now all the tenants that live there end up paying the mortgage for you. So if you buy a multiple unit property, two, three, or four, the tenants will actually, if you have a good loan guy that sets you up with a good loan, I know a few, you can actually get the tenants to pay off your debt for you. And you can live in a house rent-free that you actually own and have tax write-offs for. 10 years down the road, you only owe 650 on a house worth 1.6. They have a million dollars that you just made without having to spend one dollar out of your pocket, but the first fifty thousand dollar down payment. Wow. I wish I would have had you eleven years ago when I first got married, Ben. I could have done that. You need to fancy. <laughs> I know, right? I had to have that house with the backyard. I had something to prove too. Okay. So, you know what? Just speaking of that, having a chip on your shoulder, most people, when they have somebody like what your ex boss said to you, you weren't made for this, they listen and they agree, right? They're like, yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. And then they go and do, you know, they play small with their lives. What would be your best advice for somebody to use that type of, stuff as just fuel to get you to where you want to go. You have to realize you're worth more than a title and you aren't what you do. You're who you are. Mm. So I realized that my potential was limitless. And so nothing that you could tell me could reshape at that time. I was 20, 22. I mean, I didn't know it all, but I knew 22 years of life and I spent half hour with this guy How was he going to tell me what I was all about in 22 years or in 18 years? Mm -hmm. So someone passes judgment or criticizes you, they've known you for a hot second. I've known myself for my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to let someone's misbelief or misreading of me. Maybe I was a terrible interviewer. So what? I mean, I was going to be not a good producer. Maybe he was having a bad day. Maybe he had rosy colored glasses on. Maybe someone had peed his Cheerios. I don't really know. (laughs) I wasn't about to like change my ideals about myself, what I was capable of doing. And I believe that I owed it. It's my fiduciary responsibility to reach my potential. So I was not going to let some pipsqueak get in my way of reaching my, my ultimate calling, which was being great at whatever I did. Oh, I love it. Okay. So you said that you had a financial obligation to be successful. Is that what I heard? I've got a fiduciary to myself to reach my potential. If I'm not reaching my potential every single day, I'm not being fiduciarily responsible to myself, my inner self, my external self, my family. Like every day I've got to reach the potential of that day. Otherwise, why am I even here? Hmm. Hmm. I hope that you guys let that sink into you because I 100% agree with that statement. Um, It was just like I was on somebody's podcast earlier today and they said... um, you know, they asked the same question about what do, what do most people struggle with? And I said, it's belief in themselves. You know, they, they struggle with knowing that they are worthy. And I don't know why so many people struggle with it, but us kids from the hood, I guess we just, we believe in ourselves more (laughs) because we've seen, you know, I don't know when you've seen the worst in people, I guess you, you realize like, gosh, I have a lot going on for myself and I'm not going to be that. Uh, but it sounds like you just had that declaration. Like, okay, I am going to be successful. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. And you entertain the possibilities of how to become successful. You know, how to, how to close 3 billion in loans. And most people, they let their imagination run the other way. You know, about what are all the things that could go wrong if I follow this route. 
Do you see that with coaching people? Yeah. I mean, I think when I coach people, I don't, I realize that I'm not going to, and I had two guys come to my office yesterday and, and one guy was a coach. He was frustrated as a coach to a coach. I'm like, why are you frustrated? He goes, because I can't get my students to do what it is I'm telling them to do. And I'm like, people aren't going to change unless they want to change. Mm-hmm. So the first thing you have to do is get people to want to change. You're not going to, an alcoholic or someone that's abusing is not going, I've seen it. I, I saw it early. People kept coming back to my parents' shelter over and over again. So I think that is what made me realize that you've got to want it. And if you want it, no one can get in your way. Until you do, nothing else is going to change. So if you want to lose weight, if you want to become like you and in some inspirational you know, female leader, activist, and driving great things home, you were in the ER doing great things and you wanted something different. Like I wanted something different, but we wanted it. Mm-hmm. So you have to want it first. I don't care. If my mind's not set on something, I'm never going to get it. So I had my mind set that nothing was going to take me off of my course, not anything someone said, but until my mind is set, I'm never going to do anything. Yes. Okay, you guys. So make your mind up today on what you really want. Get super clear on your vision for your life and then work every single day or hustle like Ben says every single day until you get it. And then, and then you're going to realize when you get it, that that's not what you wanted and you're going to want more. <laughs> level. Every time the next level, would you get what you, 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 you thought you could? Let's talk about red media. Cause I haven't heard much about that from you. I know that that's something that you're really excited about. So what is red media? So red media is real estate digital, which is red media. And because I'm in the real estate space and I coach loan officers and realtors all over the place, I know that one thing that they struggle with is their ability to adapt with technology. The average age of a realtor or a loan officer is 57 and 59 years old. Mm-hmm. They didn't wake up like our kids did with a cell phone in their hands, surfing and flipping through apps and stuff. So one big Achilles heel in real estate is someone who's in the market, creating a brand and presence for themselves. So we became, instead of, you know, we were posting for them and giving these agents and realtors ideas on how to post correctly. And then all of a sudden, they wouldn't do it because their mind wasn't made up on doing it. Even ones that were really successful didn't have time to do it. So it's a done for you digital agency. So we manage all social media, video editing, coach you, but it's really a done for you digital agency. You hand over the keys to your social media. We post for you. We drive traffic for you. You see your following grow and you can go out there and be confident that the things you're doing externally to get business can be shown to everybody. And without a brand, you know, without social media, no one's going to see what you do. Mm-hmm. And I teach these LOs and realtors to be a media company first, then a marketer second, then a professional third. Because if you don't have a platform, no one's watching what you're doing. It doesn't matter how good of a salesperson you are, you're being seen by your mother and, and, and your family. And that's it. So it is a complete service where for realtors and the loan officers, we run and manage for them, their social media. We also carved out a niche for CEOs as well. So whether you're a realtor or a loan officer or a CEO, if you want your brand run and managed, we give you a personal brand manager that talks to you every other week, holds you accountable, creates a brand plan for you, finds out who your customer is, how we can follow them, how we can get you in front of more customers that need you every single day. Wow. That is genius because I mean, I have a marketing course that people will take and it's like, you can feed them all the things. Okay. Here's exactly what to do. But it's so true that people that when they already have busy jobs, it's really hard for them to like see the importance to actually implement it. So I love that you're doing that busy work for them. That's amazing. So how do people find out about Red Media? So Red Media Inc. is where we're at on Instagram. Uh, we're, we just took our website down and we're retooling it. So it'll be up in about a week or two with our new campaigns up. But the cool thing is been because we've been doing it, we've also have kind of landed some pretty cool events that we've been able to shoot for, you know, you would think that all these high profile people had had media teams, but they just don't. So we've had some pretty cool projects we've done, like Red Media just thought, just shot the Reggie Bush golf tournament where Reggie Bush was there, Chris Tucker was there, all Hall of Famers were there. That was awesome. I think I saw that on your Instagram. Yeah, it was so cool just to be a media partner with someone who has a big name but isn't doing the daily videos that it takes to get mm-hmm. the charity out there. 
So we got his charity lots of exposure and helped them raise some capital. Then we shot a, a great thing with Eric Bigger at the at this at this celebrity basketball tournament where he had people like Snoop Dogg there and like Floyd Mayweather there and shot their content. And then now we're we're doing some stuff with Terrell Owens. So Red Media is growing really quickly because people just don't have the it's like you know the WeWork space. Yeah. You can rent rent an office for a day in a fancy building, but you don't need it. For 30 days, you pay daily rent, but you get all the use out of it that you need. That's where a media kind of is on that level because someone that's rolling pretty deep that doesn't need a full on media team every single day, but it's got a cool event, they'll hire us for a day and we'll just shoot vlogs and create content for them. So we do events for people, which is really high level overarching. We help CEOs manage their media and then also our, our bread and butters with real estate agents and law officers doing it for them because they'll never do it right for themselves. I love that. Okay, you guys. So where can everybody find you on your personal Instagram? So I'm at benanderson.365. And it's .365 because every single day I'm hustling. I don't care what day it is. There's no such thing as a non-hustle day. And my businesses work for me. And um, one of my mentors is Dave Meltzer, great friend of mine. And he told me, why are you so busy working instead of going out there and making money? And so... That's kind of my mantra is create these businesses that make money for you so that every single second I spend is an ROI that I know is going to be more exponential than the time that I'm doing it. I love that advice. All right, you guys. So make sure to plug into Ben Anderson on Instagram and check out all of his stuff that he has going on with Red Media and Homeowner Now. I am so thankful that you were on the podcast today, Ben. You're a great friend and um, I do it a hundred times in a row. Aw, thank you. So, Mommy Millionaires, I want to recap what we learned from Ben today. Basically, what I learned from him every time I hang out with this guy is he just has certainty around who he is and what he wants in his life and why he's doing it. And, I mean, he gets up super early in the morning. He is a routined guy. And he just gets after it day after day, no excuses. And I think that's the type of mentality that sometimes you need to take on. You know, a lot of us, we buy into our excuses instead of buying into our dreams, buying into our vision. So I want you guys to start doing that. Also, the second thing I learned from him is I love that he talked about the renting versus buying. It was really awesome. And that great advice of like, hey, if you're looking to buy your first home right now, straight up get a fourplex. You know, Chase and I, got our first fourplex and we made $100,000 in equity, not $100,000 in equity, $100,000 in profit after selling that. And we never had to pay the mortgage out of our pockets because it was constantly paid for by the tenant. So that was super smart. I loved that. And just knowing like, Hey, uh, the five to 10 year fixed loans. I love that advice as well. So you guys make sure you're constantly filling your mind with good stuff. So you can learn what it takes to really, truly become wealthy. You got to invest in things. You got to take risks. And if you're looking to get into, you know, investing, I would look at to this guy, Ben Anderson for your loan. I hope you guys have an awesome day. Thank you for listening to the mommy millionaire podcast. For free resources and materials, head over to mommymillionaire.co. Make sure to follow Mommy Millionaire on Spotify and subscribe on iTunes. And it would mean the world to me if you left a five-star review of the show. And as always, ladies, go out there and get what you want.